You're listening to a podcast from the Word. Now, stay with the game. Who's going first? Shall I go first? Because I'm. If you want to go first, go on. Go on. Go on. Okay. Think crystals. Think soulful pictures of Scandinavian landscapes through mists. Think Northern Europe. Think New Age. New music. Age. Very okay, good. Mark. New Age. New That's Age music. Good. Think New Age groups, okay? New Age tends to be uh, a, a genre dominated by solo artists, but there are there are groups, okay? Here are five. One of them was made up, okay? Here, yeah, go here on. Are five. Alpha wave movement. Alpha <laughs> wave movement. These are good. Yeah, go These on. Good. Deep forest. Deep forest. Emerald web. Emerald Web. <laughs> I like the little whispered yes, refrain. Yeah. Emerald it's Web. It's, it's kind it's of mindfulness, it, isn't yeah, it? You know? it's, a, yeah. it's ethereal. Jade Egg. Jade Egg. Wave Star. Those five again. Alpha Wave Movement, Deep Forest, Emerald Web, Jade Egg, and Wave Star. Which one is the phony? I, over to you, Mark Allen. That is absolutely brilliant. Alpha wave <laughs> movement. That sounds real. Deep forest, I'm sure, is real. As is, I'm sure, is wave star. Do you know, I'm thinking jade egg for the simple reason that jade egg has associations with um, the kind of Gwyneth Paltrow end. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. <laughs> you bastard. And That's really... precisely what it is. I pinched it from Jay, from, from Gwyneth Paltrow. Oh, right, I've rumbled you. <laughs> That's absolutely brilliant. Jade Egg is a kind of, I don't know, it's a love toy or whatever. It's a love toy sold for kind of, you know, $755 or whatever. <laughs> oh, God. Well, at least we're not going to do a conversation about the scented candles. That's no. fantastic, Dave. Yeah, that's that's a really good category. Real. It's good. That's a it? really good category. This is a good category. Well, look, I've got for you acts who've used pseudonyms for secret oh. gigs. Oh. All right. Oh, that's a good one. Acts of use it to five examples. Four are real. One is a cunning invention. Okay, <laughs> so did uh, did Iron Maiden once play a gig billed as the entire population of Hackney? <laughs> did the Libertines ever appear uh, several times? In fact, as Gums and Roses, Gums, Gums. Sorry, Gums and Noses. It's, it's right, Gums and Noses. Sorry, <laughs> the Rolling Stones. Once played secret shows, is this true, in Toronto and Paris as the Cockroaches? Jarvis Cocker once appeared as Darren Spooner in the band Relaxed Muscle, the sound of young Doncaster. <laughs> All right. And did Genesis appear as Squonk at the Marquee in 1976 and a week later as the Colony of Slippermen? God. So there you are. Arne made the entire population of Hackney. The Libertines, Gums and Noses, Rolling Stones as the Cockroaches, Jarvis Cocker as Darren Spooner in the band Relaxed Muscle, as I say, The Sound of Young Doncaster, and Genesis, a squonk, and then a week later as The Colony of Slippermen. Well, it's a very good, very good thread. Very good thread. I haven't a clue. I'm going to guess The Cockroaches. Oh, what? It's made up? No, that's real. Oh, well, okay, fine. Oh, so that's we... real. No, that's <laughs> real. I thought I'd rather give it away with the gums you're, and noses. You're, you're the winner this week, so who's the made-up one? No, the made-up one is Genesis, who never appeared as Squonk. Squonk. In fact, they did have a track called Squonk. They did have a track And they Squonk. had a track called The Colony of Slipmen. I can't remember. I think they were on The Lamb Lies Down at Broadway and possibly Trick of the Tail. But they never actually appeared. They did appear as The Garden Wall, in fact, which is not a very exciting <laughs> But there we are. So, oh, you, so you're oh, this week's I've winner. Triumphed. I've triumphed. <laughs> So yesterday afternoon, we're recording this on Sunday. Uh, yesterday afternoon, I was sitting there. I was multi-screening. I was doing some work. I was keeping track of the football on one screen. And I was keeping track of CNN, uh, which is my channel of choice when it comes to coverage of the American election. Have you been watching who the first? CNN? Who the, no, I haven't. And, and everyone, there's so many people. CNN this have just <coughs> been brilliant. And particularly this guy, John King, who's their kind of stats guy, is the man in charge of electronic map. And he has set new standards for kind of command of the facts and figures and, and coolness under pressure. They, he was set standards that will resound around the world of broadcasting. And all these people will have to up their game in the light of what this guy did. I've never seen such cool. 
I've never seen such ability to be able to make calculations in his head while operating this unbelievably sophisticated touchscreen, which clear, which did everything they wanted it to do. Anyway, the weird thing about uh, about CNN is that they're not just reporting the news; they're kind of making the news because when it comes to election, they have to decide when they're going to call it. You know what I mean? And they were the first to call it, weren't they? Well, were they? I do not know. I just happened to be watching it. They probably were, uh, you know, because they possibly have more resources. They probably have more boots on the ground than anybody else when it comes to a story like this. And so they'd been, frankly, they'd been kind of treading water for about 24 hours because they'd had to. And, you know, they'd been running over the same things. We're, we're waiting for the count in this county and so forth. And that will tell us a little bit more about the trend and, and where it's going and so forth. And then suddenly they switched without warning, while I only had half an eye on the screen, to announcing. So you get sting. You get the... You know, Wolf Blitzer appears there and goes... CNN is now prepared to project that the next president of the United States is Joe Biden. And a sudden graphic of Joe Biden and all the all, all this starts happening. And so the channel suddenly immediately switches from speculation about, about what might happen next to acceptance that this is what has happened. And now it's loads of reflection about what does this mean for the country and all that kind of stuff. And so I immediately switched. I immediately went to the New York Times site, and they also had announced, you know. So I flicked around NBC. They'd announced. I don't know whether they'd done it like 30 seconds after CNN or what. I don't know. But, you know, the, the result was Had the he same. won Pennsylvania at that point? No, because he's... Because I don't it, think it, he had. No, he still hasn't. But they, they've been, you know, for the previous 24 or 48 hours, they've been looking at the trend, and they kept going back to their decision desk who are the boffins upstairs who decide when it is safe for them to risk their reputation yeah. by saying, this is what's going to happen. And he had been explaining, chat from Decision Desk had been explaining regularly, well, we're watching for the trend. We were, as long as it stays over 65%, it, it cannot go back or anything, something like this. And so it obviously reached the point where... I know, that's all agreed. I mean, lots of people have if, you, if you're going to wait... If you're going to wait until absolutely every last vote, oh, absolutely, candidate, you're going to be late. Because the funny thing is, two minutes after I looked at the New York Times site, I look at the BBC site and say, BBC the, B- the BBC is prepared to announce. And I thought, oh, come on, that's rich. The BBC is watching the same television as everybody yeah. else. They're thinking, well, if CNN have gone with it, it's oh, safe God. for us to do so. Yeah, so exactly. I, that's at uh, that point I tweeted that Smash Hits is now prepared to predict. <laughs> I saw that. Yeah. You know, it's... Uh, I don't see the point of watching uh, watching British broadcasters during an event like this in 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 contemporary in the in the com- communications universe that we live in nowadays, where you know the people nearest to the story are the Americans. Are the Americans to the story. precisely? And you, and you can watch them just as easily as you can watch anything else. So why wouldn't you? I I simply don't understand. So. It was um, It was so fascinating because somebody had to go with it first, and the only thing that could possibly overturn it is any of these spurious legal actions that Trump there, which are, none of which we, are going to amount to anything. I, I, the, I the thing that excited me most, I watched so much this last night, was the idea that somebody said that Trump was now a flight risk. Are you following this? The idea that no, he, he, he could just, because you know, he could just get on an airplane in the dead of night and fly somewhere abroad. And, and well, then I, I've got this romantic I, fantasy that then tries to live in complete anonymity. And I can't think of anybody less well-equipped to, to live in anonymity in some kind of bunker somewhere to avoid the ruinous lawsuits because he has countless lawsuits, doesn't he? About the billions of dollars he owes, about his tax evasion. I mean, absolutely mm. astonishing. All of which he he couldn't uh, be held to account over while he was the, the President of the United States. So he's but got that like, hanging over him. I feel sorry for but the... But where's he going to live? He can't, he, can't, he can't really return to New York, can he? I can't, can't imagine he'd be terribly I, I well don't think, I don't to think live in Florida. Florida. Yeah. The, um, I feel very sorry for anybody who's involved in the... the they're going to they're gonna have to have a recount in Georgia, aren't they? Because it's within yeah. the... the within 0.05 the parameters. Yeah. Um, and so some poor sods are going to have to, you know, work for like two or three days or whatever, going through all this even though nobody in the world, apart from one person... Only one person believes, would possibly care. Believes yeah. And it won't make any difference anyway. Anything at all. And it won't affect things anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, riveting day. 
And what, a, what an amazing thing, dear, a little tiny ray of sunshine. I got all these texts from various people. One of my sisters, my brother-in-law, you know, with a bottle of champagne. You know, it's just, it's so nice because people just can't quite process good news. We're not used to it. Uh, uh, yeah, well, it's a long way to go, I'm sure. Um, I mean, some might say that the best thing he could probably do is run away to Saudi Arabia or, you know, anything rather than the damage that he could do in the next 11 weeks. Well, as he only did one term, of course, he can run for another term. So in four years' time, he could be campaigning to come back. So there is that hanging over us too. Yeah, well, so... uh, But for the moment, you know, it's just nice to have one less prick to worry about. (laughs) The Word Podcast. Prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. So we just heard that um, that if, if live music and live theatre re- returns uh, in next year, there's lots of exciting new things we can look forward to, Mark, aren't there? Including um, an Osmond's musical. An that's, Osmond. that's, that's the pinnacle, isn't it? That's what we've been dreaming of. That's it's going to kickstart dream- the entertainment industry. <laughs> Crazy horses, I should imagine it'll be cool. It'll but, also uh, yeah. be presumably the Osmonds done by people who are not the Osmonds. So yep. it does work, really, does it? Yeah, I mean, Donnie's still with us, isn't he? <laughs> we like, are he? Or, or is he? Well, musicals yeah, traditionally are done by people who aren't the, the, the original cast. Bad, aren't they? That, is bad. that is true. That is true. Oh, I also read Alex is, is sending us uh, messages as they come in that steps are returning too. I suppose that, you know, in this in this unique situation, you may as well just say. No matter how hopeless you are, you may as well just say, we're planning a major world tour next year because you probably won't be called. Because you almost certainly won't do it, but you'll certainly get the publicity, which is what you need to keep the old uh, back catalogue floating. I know. So in other pop news, uh, very sad to note the death of Jeffrey Palmer. Oh, Jeffrey Palmer. Yeah, I suppose that is pop news. What a great man. (laughs) What uh, a great man. And also, I suppose he would define the word lugubrious. Wouldn't he? There was a hang, bit written hang about him by dog. Hang Dog, a, a bit written about him in The Guardian, described his bloodhound face, jowly and still, and his hooded eyes, <laughs> and how he used to play figures of authority and moral rectitude. And actually, I don't think he was really like that in real life, was he? So imagine going through your sure entire life acting, acting. No, you just, you, you've just, you've adopted a role that is nothing like what you're actually like. It must be very confusing for people. So the um, the uh, Danny Kelly and I were uh, were discussing him on Twitter, and um, of course he's is associated in my mind with primarily actually with his marvelous appearance in Faulty Towers. Uh, That's my like, favorite Faulty Towers moment. <laughs> I'm going to remind you, my favorite Faulty Towers moment of all of them is when they discover that the hotel guest is dead in his bed with his breakfast tray. And unless I'm entirely mistaken, Basil, Sybil, I think, Basil thinks it's because the kippers are beyond their sell-by date and the kippers have killed him. So he starts to try and throw the kippers out, the kipper out the window, at which point Sybil feels his pulse and, and, and then looks at him again. She says, he hasn't touched the kippers. And then Basil says something like, uh, "He's stone dead. He's 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 stone cold." He said, "Oh joy, thank you God, I'm so happy." And he's just jumping up and down because the man is dead because he hasn't touched his kippers. At which point, Jeffrey Palmer walks into the room, doesn't he? I think Jeffrey Palmer is a doctor, and yeah. uh, he's staying in the hotel, and he called upon he is called upon to to pronounce the man dead which he he does yeah yeah, yeah. And, and jeffrey with that kind of um, utter kind of realism that that characterizes the doctors as a profession because they deal with life and death and they have to get on with it at every at every moment yeah he then uh, returns to what he really wants out of life which is he wants sausages doesn't he that's his main thing is sausages he wants sausages that's all he cares about he's absolutely <laughs> insistent he goes into. The, he ends up in the kitchen doing them himself, and there's a wonderful line. Are they goes, carting the corpse past says, in a wicker basket? I, I thought you were a doctor. He says, "I'm a doctor, and I want my sausages." That's right. <laughs> God bless him, Jeffrey Paul. God, that was funny. Another thing, Danny and I were, uh, you know, remembering with great fondness 
was, of course, his wonderful um, part in The Fall and Rise of Reginald. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Which is, has there ever been a series that gave birth to so many catchphrases as The Fall and Rise of Reginald Perrin? You know what I mean? Have a nice day. I won't. That's <laughs> right. Out. And, um, you know, sorry, sorry, I'm late. You know, uh, lions on the line at uh, Clapham Junction or whatever. And then the two, you know, when um, CJ, I didn't get where I am today without so and so. Yeah. Whenever he had his two, his two kind of uh, toadies would listen to his ideas. What would they say? Both of them would say a one, single word. One would go great, and the other one would go super. And it just, it just. I remember <laughs> that. Yeah, you know, I can remember everything about the so, Fall and Rise of Original Power. Office conversation must have been so changed by that program, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. Uh, and of course, nothing greater than Jeffrey Palmer as uh, as his brother-in-law, wasn't he, Jimmy? Yeah. Kind of down on his luck, military officer, and um, and he he um, he <laughs> come round to catch food. And he goes, sorry, I wouldn't bother you. There's been a bit of a cock up on the catering front. Do you remember? Yes. On the catering front. Yeah. I remember saying that at work for years. People yeah. going, you know, have you got any food in? No, there's been a cock up, on the, cock up on the catering front. That's right. And he also, he also, as Danny reminded me, he, is, he uttered the line that still contains the two words that I still think would make the greatest band name ever. Which Go is on. Rum Cove Johnny Woman. Because <laughs> I still think Johnny Woman is a brilliant name for a group of either sex. It doesn't matter. It's a great name. But he is, that the, where, is that where that came where from? That's where it came from. Rum you know, Cove Johnny I, Woman. I'm not sure if I knew that. I thought that was just something we'd invented at Q Magazine. No, 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 no. No, it was Jeffrey Palmer in, uh, in Reginald Perry. A Rum Cove Johnny Woman. No, just, just Rum I know. Cove. To, Rum Cove, Johnny, Johnny Woman. Woman. It's fantastic. All, all four words are absolutely perfect. It's genius. Absolute genius. So that's David Nobbs writing, of course. But Jeffrey Palmer, we salute the great yeah, Jeffrey great Palmer. Man. God, he gave us some pleasure over the years. And, the, and what was he, 93, I think? It and it's interesting that, that, you know, when serious actors die, you know, people get into the most extraordinary contortions to express how fabulous they were, their art. And there's never, uh, there's never that kind of level of, of understanding uh, and credit for comic actors, I don't think. Do you? It's just no, not taken it's seriously. Whole, it's like the whole thing about the Oscars. How many, how many great comic actors have won Oscars compared to, um, you know, uh, you know, the ones who have serious roles, you know. It's just it it it's incomparable. But it's also if it, it interests me that Jeffrey Palmer is the kind of person, that, and Jeffrey Palmer didn't always do comedy. You know, he would have done quite a bit of drama over the yeah. years. Um, but he 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 is the kind of person that referred to as a character actor, isn't he? Yeah, he was. Yeah. Look, and I thought it really intrigues me. What is a character actor? Really, I kind of understand, but I want to know. And I looked it up. And they said that the main thing that characterizes a character actor is they're not the leading man or woman. They're they're not in the lead, you know. So all our all our kind of plaudits always go to whoever is in the lead, in the lead part, as if their their artistry is consequently greater than anybody else. It's not true at all. It's just the it's just the We're, way the drama is done, you know. So Reginald Perry, Leonard Rossiter, God bless him, he was great, you know. Got all so the credit. Was, so were loads of people in in you know in the Fallen Rise of Reginald Perry. And going back to Faulty Towers, I've I've droned on about this incessantly recently because it struck me again and again. But what it's the strength of the cast, them? isn't it? It's the strength of them all. They're phenomenal. Absolutely, everybody who gets on in front of that camera is trying to do the best work they've ever done in their lives. You know, and it doesn't matter whether that's John Cleese or it's, or it's uh, Jeffrey Palmer or it's Bernard Crittin. But it's Cleese that hired them and it's Cleese that to some extent directed them. But yeah, I mean, you're right. absolutely right. Quite the supporting right. cast is incredible. <coughs> it's the strength of what they do. And they're not trying to hog the limelight. They're just doing what they do. You know, yeah. they're just they're carrying through the fast to its logical conclusion. They're so that's one of the great joys of if you want an excuse to go back and watch Faulty Towers, go back and watch it. Now I heartily recommend you do. 
and ignore John Cleese, Brunello Scales, and and, Man, and Andrew Sack. What's the major? Just, just watch, watch the Manuel. major. Yeah, yeah the well, major Ken, is incredible. Ken Campbell, where it, Campbell Campbell appears in the one where it's where it's Sybil's birthday, playing rather Ovi jovial friend of the family. God, he's brilliant. All those people. Eunice Stubbs is in that one as well. So many people pop through those. those Bernard things. Cribbins, and, fantastic Cribbins. stand, isn't he? Well, Cribbins can do no wrong, you know, yeah. as we as we've re- repeatedly said on this on this podcast. But they do but, deserve more credit, those guys, because the Oscars is entirely about Daniel Day Lewis. That's okay. the kind of world it occupies. It doesn't matter yeah. by the world of the comic actor. No, 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 no. So anyway, um, in the absence of anything happening in the music business, which it's it's clearly not. Um, it, I, I thought we'd look back on records that came out this week 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Okay? 50. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go on. Okay. So I'm going to go back. And I've got a few, I've got a few beside me here. Okay? So this week in 1970, okay? So how many years ago? That's 50 years ago. 50 yeah. years ago. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Uh, no, no dice. An interesting pop fact. Does anybody know who that girl is on the cover? Uh, I don't think they do. The band didn't know who, who she was. I think oh, she was really? booked by Richard DeLello, was it? Who, the guy who worked so Richard Apple? DeLello, who was the way, I, that was the question I was going to ask you. Who took the picture? It was Richard DeLello, the guy oh, in the, the house. Picture too. He took the picture. He was the house hippie at uh, Apple. House Records. hippie is the guy who wrote the longest cocktail party. Longest Fantastic cocktail party. book about Apple. But I, I think he just got a hold of her, and took, I'm not sure if he even he just saw her in some model agency or something. Like that. I don't think anybody knows who that girl is. The band had no idea at all. Extraordinary. It's my button. Gene, Ma- Gene Marn and Richard Delello joint effort. It's called. And so what it, an extraordinary story! The development of that record because. You know, they, 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 Jeff Emmerich had tried to produce it for a long time and failed. But, he well, most of it is produced by Jeff Emmerich. There's one track produced by Mal Evans. I know, Mal oh. Evans, yes. Beatles, Beatles Roadie. I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. But then after that, George Harrison came in, didn't he, for about a month? This was around the time I don't know if it's on the, was it on this one? Yeah, and then know. I think they got Todd Rundgren in for a while to try and produce it. Oh, was that a later sure. one? Then? Oh, was it? I don't think it was that one. I'm not sure it was. It might be. It might be. Yeah, Beatles, yeah. Beatles experts will be able to will be able to um, tell us whether we're right or wrong on that. But anyway, so that's that's 50 years ago this week. That you know, so yeah. So usual, usual calculation. 50 years before that takes us to 1920. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the Spanish flu is still the Spanish flu still kicking in. Is still around. Oh lord. And and then and then we go 40 years ago. This week, 40 big top 20 years ago. This week, this came out. This is Dirty Prince Mind by Prince. Prince's Dirty Mind, which it, I, I don't know this record terribly well, really. I mean, it kind of got overshadowed by later, later albums of his that were big successes. But it is kind of extraordinary to me that, that he belonged to the age of 1980. You know what I mean? Yeah, it seems like a long, long time ago. For him to have been ahead of the game, yeah. and a weird record all about all sorts of peculiar stuff, isn't it? Incest I, I, and adventurous that, shagging. <laughs> you know, I've told I remember Robert Christgau wrote a review of it, and he said uh, he said it specialised in in full fledged fuck book fantasies. He said Mick Jagger should fold up his penis and go home. <laughs> so well, he didn't, uh, did he? No, he didn't. Oh, no, no. So that, he's also Prince, who made there were 106 singles and 39 albums in 32 years. Right? I can't think of anybody being more productive. That's astonishing, isn't it? The 106. amount of songs he wrote, 100, I think 106 singles came out during that time. I mean, the number of songs he wrote, it's absolutely extraordinary. So uh, so I'm going to jump ahead, actually. Go I, I'm going to, because you talked about 106 singles, I'm going to talk about a group who made 27 singles that they all went to number one. And this came out 20 years Oh, I've got this. I've got it here. Have you, have you got it here? Could it be that? It could. It's yeah. that. It's, yeah, it's yeah. The, Beatles, the Beatles number one, or it's just called one, wasn't it? Uh, came out 20 years ago this week, um, which contains, as it says on the on that little sticker on the cover, 27 uh, number one singles on one CD. 
I don't think I've ever played it, really. It's have a fantastic... Played? I play a lot. It's fantastic. Do you really? Because you get the really early stuff, you know, and you know what that's going to be. And, and it's amazing also that it took so long for it to come out. This, I mean, not till 2000, you know. Um, but they, you also get Penny Lane, you get Eleanor Rigby. You get something, you get come together. So, I mean, that's so, an but, incredible compilation, isn't it? Okay, here is, here's a challenge to you, Mark Helen. What's the best track on one? Okay, we're both looking at the same record. Okay, you can only pick one. Yeah. I'd, be, I'd be tempted to go for Penny Lane, which I absolutely love. Oh, I love uh, Penny Lane. Uh, that's a difficult one. She Loves You, I think, is is, is, fair, is hard to beat. Uh, I, Lady Madonna's fantastic, too, although it's not clean. Up. I'm going to tell you. What's the answer? I'll tell you the answer. The answer, because I know you're in the dark, Mark, and, you know, I'm here to just lighten your darkness and go tell on. you what the answer is. The greatest track on the Beatles, number one, is back after these messages. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> this is a junction in the Word podcast. It separates that bit from this next bit. David Hepworth has posed the question, what is the best track on the Beatles' number one compilation? I think I know. Well, I, 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 I know the answer. Either Penny Lane or it's Help. Uh, I mean, there are lots of contenders, but it's one of those two. Go on, tell me the answer. Now, the answer, Mark, uh, I'm so pleased to be able to uh, put you right here. Ah! <laughs> the answer is I want to hold your hand. And you know why? Apart from the fact it's because just... it's the record that conquered America. No, I don't know. Was it was it the one that yeah, finally well, came yeah, to well, it, it? it was kind of that, and she loves you. Uh, finally came out kind of end of '63 yeah. uh, in America, and were huge, and were yeah. the big hit records when they went to America in February 1964. But serious, kind of serious point. I mean, it's a fantastic record. But the thing that strikes me listening to the Beatles is there was a period during which they were they were making brilliant records that were made more brilliant by the fact that they were absolutely thrilled at how successful they were. And so you get this insane kind of, you know, it's like they all talk about football teams, you know, do they play well because they're confident or are they confident because they play well, you know? And, and you get this virtuous circle. You just can't There's see an where it ends. Incredible you know, energy, isn't there? It's right. Absolute, absolute crackles, jubilation uh, about my God. We can do anything. Look at this. Yeah. We're on top of this thing. How long we'll stay on top of this thing? I do not know. But we're on a you know but we're, we're here. And we're enjoying. We're on a it. unicycle yeah. going over a tightrope over Niagara Falls, and we're just gonna bloody keep going. You know what I mean? For as long as it lasts. And and you get that for the first time, I feel, even more than She Loves You, you get that in I Want to Hold Your Hand. That, that The way it starts, you think, the confidence with which it starts and flies to the finish. And uh, and that then animates, you know, Can't Buy Me Love, Hard Day's Night, I Feel Fine, all those things that come after it. So that's the answer, That's Mark. the answer. I still can't believe, though, things that was she, she loves you, that they wrote that on, what was it, a Wednesday or a Thursday night, I think, while they are on tour. <clears throat> I think they recorded it on the Saturday. And so it's only two or three days old. Uh, they tried it out, I think, on, on McCartney's dad to see if he liked it. Um, <laughs> no one else had heard it. And, uh, and George and Ringo hadn't heard it when they came into the studio at Abbey Road to record it. And yet... Later that day, it was finished. Do you think that's extraordinary? <laughs> that they'd heard that song for the first time, arranged it and played it with yeah. that level of utter, utter perfection. It's phenomenal. So we were talking about that. So that was 20 years ago yeah. this, this week that that came out. And 30 years ago this week, which takes us to um, November 1990. 1990. This comes out, which is... The second album by the Travelling Wilburys. Called, amusingly, Travelling Wilburys Volume 3. I'd only oh. noticed that. Yeah, though. I think so. It's just a hilarious George Harrison joke. Actually, it's, they should. the honest truth is they should never have done it. <laughs> Roy Orbison was dead. It's got no... I mean, I, does anybody remember any of the songs on that? She's My Baby, Inside Out. Do you remember any of these songs? I don't. I don't really, no, no, no. But the tra first Travelling Wilburys album is absolutely... I think it came out in 88. It's fantastic. It's a good record, isn't it's it? It's a really? really, really, really good record. And all sorts of mythology was invented about how the group came together. And I think what happened was that George was having dinner, wasn't he, with with, um, 
with Jeff Lynne and being asked to do another B-side for a track of his yeah, Cloud Nine yeah, album. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, and, 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 and Roy Orbison was there and he asked him to come to the session and then they said to Bob Dylan, could they use his studio in Malibu? And then asked Tom Petty if he'd like to bring a guitar. And so that's how they got together in the first place and decided, let's keep going. But, I mean, that's a fantastic record. But the, but the real kind of raison d'etre was uh, Roy Orbison, really, wasn't it? Well, I think it is because, you know, George made a little speech, according to Tom Petty, on the first day to, to, to Lennon, to, 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 to Dylan, saying, look, we, you know, we're all rather in awe of you, but, you know, let you, let's all just, you know, play on a level playing field here. And, uh, and uh, but Dylan's point was he was in awe of, uh, oh, well, he claimed to be in awe of them, but also in awe of uh, Roy Orbison. So the fact that Roy Orbison was there was from a different generation that they could all look up to was what brought them together, don't you think? Well, also, also, Roy Orbison, a uh, genuinely unique voice, really. You know? Absolutely. So it, it's like singing with Pavarotti, isn't it? You know, yeah, yeah. If you're a standard opera singer or somebody, there, there are some very few people come along that, who have an instrument like Roy Orbison. Yeah. Had, you know, and... Uh, and you hear it, um, you hear it on that first record. I might play that first record that later. Soaring but... tenor, it's fantastic. fantastic. But what great the first record, Handle with Care, Dirty World, Tweeter oh, and the yeah. Monkey Man. I mean, that's a really good record. And it sold millions, it sold three million in the in the US alone. Yeah. It's really incredible. Yeah. Six hundred thousand in Canada. It's a fantastic record. So those are my completely non-scientific uh, musical anniversaries for uh, to make up for the fact there's nothing else going on this week. Although there was there was a story that we were looking at about somebody who had been signed by Universal Music. Was it about the age? I think they're they're not even born yet, or something like that. How, how, <laughs> how, how, <laughs> the girl called Angelina Jordan. No, she's born in she's, she's signed at age fourteen to to uh, as it, Republic Records. Or she's a Norwegian girl. I mean, she's an amazing story. At the age of seven, she won a big talent contest in Norway. At the age of eight, she sang before uh, she sang "What a Wonderful World" at the Nobel Peace, Peace Prize ceremony. And when she was 11, she sang up to 40,000 people at a, at a festival in South Korea. So she was already a massive star at the age of 11. Do you remember the old Peter Sellers, Best of Sellers record? Had a, had a track on it called I'm Oh So Ashamed about a rock star who peaked at the age of nine. <laughs> My curly hair is getting thin. It's all that all those women in wine. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's a, but it's a grand tradition, isn't it? Kate Bush was signed when she was 16, wasn't she? Well, yeah, she she was yeah finally signed when she was sixteen, but she'd been around a little while. She'd been around she? a while. David Gilmore discovered, her, I think, I made some demos with her, so she'd been around. And also the the showbiz rock kid, Steve Marriott. Steve Marriott was uh, the Artful Dodger when he was thirteen. In fact, there's a thread. Rock stars were the Artful Do Dodger. Phil Collins was the Artful Dodger. Also, he's well, thirteen. Yeah, yeah Bill, David Bill Jones, Co the Monkees. Bill Collins' mother ran a stage school, didn't she? That's right. That's right. Um, and it was Mickey uh, Dolenz, I think, was Dave, when Davy he Jones. Yeah, Davy Jones was the Arthur Dodger because Davy Jones was was the Arthur Dodger in the broad on the production of Oliver that opened uh, in the United States at the same time as the Beatles arrived, and so he was on the first Ed Sullivan show with the Beatles. So he we, was. That's right. The same. That's right. So he was in the wings. I got the DVD watching, that. <laughs> you know, which is interesting because. Two years later, he was uh, probably not even not even long as two years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was kind of doing an impression of them. But so uh, no, they, they they. It strikes me that there's never been more um, people who presumably have. I mean, they're highly motivated young people, but they've probably got very motivated parents that that get them on this ladder quite early. And the classic case of this is Taylor Swift. It's Taylor Swift's whole family. Oh, one of, she won upset. a talent contest, didn't she, when she was about four? Well, <laughs> and they, they decided that Nashville was the place she ought to be. And they, yeah. they, they don't come from anywhere near Nashville. I think Dad was on Wall Street or was, yeah. was in finance or something like that. And so the Upsticks went to, to Nashville to work with, um, you know, the factory songwriters to get her a start in. Uh, Incredible. In so Celine Dion, same sort of thing, wasn't it? When she was 13, I think she got a deal in 1981 or whatever. And her manager, I think, remortgaged his house because he believed so much. She'd go. And she, I think she had a she's a major, had a major hit when she was about 13 or 14 years old. I mean, it's astonishing. You know what they always but, say in the world of tennis, where if you're looking for the next, you know, uh, Steffi Graf or, or Serena Williams or whatever, don't look for talent, look for mad parents. 
Well, it, yes, it's the mad parent who gets it's, them. <laughs> it's absolutely true. It's the yeah, it's the Jenny Murrays who, would, you know, if it's unkind to call a man. Oh, but, Je- I mean, she, no, Jenny oh, Murray is well. Jenny Murray is a tennis pro, you know, so she kind of understands the business. She's got an excuse, but people like Richard Williams or Monica Stellish's father, or yeah, or, yeah, uh, yeah. Andre Agassi's father. Go yeah. and read Andre Agassi's autobiography about how his father built a tennis court in the backyard in Las Vegas. And he knew nothing about tennis at all, but he just decided his son was going to be a top tennis player. Yeah, yeah. And was. But at what a cost to Andre Agassi. But um, who ended up who ended up marrying Steffi Graf because you never really marry somebody who's went gone through the same thing. Yes, you would understand it. You know. So, but still uh, leading the way on the on the on the starting early stage. Surely, surely it's Michael Jackson, isn't it? Wasn't he six when he joined the Jackson Brothers? He would. Incredible. Be. I think he was touring the Chitlin circuit when he was eight. I mean, that is just ridiculous. There's a driven father for you. Yes. Yeah, they're not going away, are they? There's uh, these kind of um, this kind of setup. We shall see more of this in the future. The Watch. Word Podcast. Fix yourself a drink, and it's like being in the pub. Well, it's time for any other business. We're joined by Alex Gold. Hello, Hello Alex. How's the weather up there? Actually, just as you said that, the sun came out. Good. Thanks, Dave. It's as it has well. for Dave. Dave, you're in a patch of sunlight as well. I, I nearly went we all sunglasses. I know. Yeah, let's hope it lasts all day. Um, so what have we got? What what have we got going on, Alex, to tell people about? Well, we have a, a crowdcast event. We on do on Tuesday. Tuesday, don't we? We do. You're absolutely right. Yes. Uh, is it the 10cc book? It is. Yes. Where are we? Here it is. Liam, have you got it there? Yeah, it's Liam Newton. Uh, Liam Newton talking about the talking worst about ten- band in the world is the title of the book. It's I'm the- looking forward to this. I'll be good on 10cc. <laughs> um, no, no great f- fondness, I feel. And that's something that should, should be rectified. Yes, they you should. Brilliant. They made a lot of fantastic records. Yeah, absolutely. there isn't that kind of there isn't that kind of massive fan base sort of uh, affection for them. Well, to but, be discussed. But they they did all so many things. You know, it's extraordinary that book. How many different people and eras and genres fit yeah. across its pages? You know, yeah, they, absolutely. They absolutely did everything. I'll be able to get my Hot Legs album out for that. I've got, Have you I've got, got the, the album? I've got the Hot Legs. Well, album. with Neanderthal Man. With Neanderthal it? Man. Oh it's goodness! Got, it's called Thinks School Stinks. Uh, <laughs> it's a kind of uh, a Beano joke, I suppose. So that's coming up. And if you're a Patreon uh, supporter. You'd be able to be in the room for that yep. conversation, which takes place on Tuesday night. I think that's right. It's on Tuesday night, seven o'clock. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what else is coming up? We've got the uh, the uh, the the weekly quiz, quiz o'clock, which is now accompanies the kind of cocktail hour on a Friday evening, doesn't it? It kicks off at six o'clock, and it's entered a bold new uh, dimension, hasn't it? By yes. the introduction of of picture clues now Pictures. in addition to the usual written clues and uh so we get more and more people every week joining that and uh you know if you win bring your own uh, crisps and uh, uh woolly ale exactly. bring your own old english cider and walker's crisps <laughs> and uh and uh, you know if you do well enough you may even get onto alex's famous leaderboard yeah, and you remember it's currently topped by Alex. So then we've got a new leader, haven't we? There are actually there. There are, there are two as joint two people yeah, jostling on, on on the gold podium at the moment. Um, right, it's Matt Button who's been he's been number one for I think about fifteen weeks. Oh, what? Um, he's taking a lot of deposing, isn't he? Yeah, <laughs> and I think it looks like his reign could be nearly over. Well, Andrew Slattery has, has yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <coughs> the plates. He's the coming force. John yeah. Kinderman has made a glorious return to the to the third third spot. It's an it's an exciting time. <laughs> it's an, yeah. it's an exciting time in Friday night it is. quizzes. <laughs> so if you're a Patreon supporter, obviously you'd be able to you be able to join that and uh, and avail yourself of loads of other things. You'll be able to see everything that we do and hear everything that we do before anybody else hears it. Absolutely, that so, to just about everything, uh, and some. And over the next week, we're launching our list of the best music books of the year, which will hopefully be full of some suggestions. Uh, if you want to put that in in, in front of a, 
of a relative who might buy you something for relative Christmas. thinking about Christmas, thinking yes. about Christmas, and then we're also going to record little videos where we talk about each of each of those books. Uh, we're doing our usual word in your attics, which are going from strength to strength. Uh, who we had over the last few weeks? Where uh, people, Chris Difford, uh, great Difford. one with Chris Difford. Chris Difford, what a great shed! Apart from anything, else. absolutely the right. world's it's most enviable shed. Ideal, yes. ideal awesome. shed. Shed and Garden magazine would have surely been beating a path to his... Uh, and Stuart Bailey, we had a fantastic one, Stuart Bailey talking about his Van Morrison album. Van Absolutely, Morrison book, Van, Van Morrison book, yeah. Uh, we've had over the last few weeks, who if we have, we've had Billy Bragg, of course. Right. It's all there. It's all there. Go on YouTube slash Word in Your Ear. It's absolutely all there for you to enjoy. But please, we'd like you to take part as much as possible and uh, to go and look at being a Patreon supporter. You go to patreon.com slash word in your ear and you find out what level you might like to get involved at. Is there anything further to say, Alex? Yes, uh, I think we should say hello to, to our new patrons. Oh, right. Oh, go on, yes. This week, uh, Simon Hemsley, the great uh, Simon Hemsley. Go Thank you, Simon. Uh, Doug Popper, who is an annual patron. Um, sorry, here, give me the first name again. I missed that. Simon Hemsley. Yeah, the first, no, sorry, the first name, the first name of the second person. Go ah, on. Doug Hopper. Doug Hopper. Right, Doug Hopper. right. Hello, Doug. Right. Um, he's an annual patron. Of course, if you subscribe annually, you get a hefty 15% discount. It's worth doing. Um, Makes sense. You and also, if you do it in time for your birthday, you get the prospect of me and, me and Mark Ellen coming down your digital chimney. Uh, <laughs> that's right great, rummaging through your record collection which is very good fun yeah for a, we've for done a special, quite a few of those special word in your attic which we've done quite a few of those all, yeah. already so you might like to think about those if you've got a birthday coming up soon anyway carry on Alex uh, also Martin Whitley all right Martin Bless thank you all. very much nice nice to Indebted. see you all nice to see you all on board and uh, nice to see we'll, you see you nice to see you nice this podcast was brought to you by The Word. Hey.